All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the book club for Chapter 22, Arrow in the R3DS book, especially the second edition. Um, I'm Ken. I'm going to be covering this chapter. So for this chapter um, 22, which is called Arrow, we're going to learn the following things. We're going to learn about using the Arrow package to load in large data files efficiently. We're also going to talk about partitioning partitioning large data files into parquet files for quicker access, less memory usage, and quicker wrangling. And we'll also talk about working with the data in the arrow data format or parquet format using existing dplyr operations. So to start off, um, the big question I think anyone's going to ask is, why learn arrow? Well, as you may have recall from chapter 21, we learned a little bit about databases and how to connect and work with it. And you've seen how you know, R is very capable of handling it, especially doing it very quickly and allowing you to do some SQL in it. And so part of the reason why we're learning Arrow has to do with the fact that a lot of the data that you've seen so far before the chapter 21 and so on, a lot of it has been stored in CSV files, simply because CSV is a pretty easy format to access and almost any spreadsheet app that you pull up like Excel or sheets or so on can read it and easily make columns and rows out of it. And so while it's very simple to use and you probably see it in any office environment, they can be a little complicated to work with because they can be too big and messy to read and work with, especially since that, um, since um, CSV sometimes, especially you get as it gets bigger, it becomes harder to read and it takes up a lot of space sometimes to read them. So because of that, there's a need to have a way to quickly read giant data sets and be able to do it in a, in a tidy way, so to speak. Some of which you've seen in chapter 21, but this chapter will go more into detail about how you can do it with more complicated and larger data sets. And so in this case, you have something like Arrow, this package, to be able to do that. And so... For this package arrow, the first thing you want to do in order to get this is you want to download the package arrow by running this command in your R console. Install.packages arrow. So you want to go to your console. So I'm going to pull up my R Studio. So you would go here and then you type install.packages arrow. And then I'm not going to press enter because I already have it installed, but if you press enter, it should be able to install it. And it might take a while, maybe like a couple of seconds. But eventually, you'll be able to install it. So yeah, you want to run this install.packages arrow in here, right right here. OK. And once you do that, then you want to run the code chunk below in order to get the packages that are going to be needed for the rest of this chapter. So arrow db plier, which is like d plier, where you do mutate and all of that, but for databases, some of which you saw in the previous chapter where we talked about databases, and then duck db, which we learned about in the previous chapter for having ways to connect to a database, and then of course the tidyverse. So you want to run all this into your R console or in your R, R document, wherever you're running your code. So we can do that here. So we go here, library arrow, db plier, duck db, and tidyverse, and then just click run, and it will load them all up. So we're going to need all of these packages for this chapter. OK, just to demonstrate how arrow works, um, we're going to demonstrate it by downloading this data set from, from, the, from the city government of Seattle where it covers item checkouts from Seattle libraries here. Now, just as a heads up, um, if you're gonna download it, just be careful download, downloading it because you don't wanna download this by hand because it is a really huge data set. I mean, it has four, 41 million rows and this 41 million, 389, 465 rows, which is a lot. And it's about nine gigabytes, so, which is pretty huge. So it's not something that you want to download by hand. I mean, you could try, but do expect that it's going to be a little bit slow. And for those of you who have very slow internet, it might be a challenge. So 
do be careful about downloading this. It's really huge. Instead, uh, what you want to do is use this code below to download it here, which all this code here, it's designed to specifically handle big data sets and it will give you a progress bar that will check, that will allow you to check how much of the file has been downloaded. So you can use this code here to download it. I'm not gonna run it because it's really big and I wouldn't wanna take up a lot of your time. And so thankfully I downloaded it ahead of time. So you just wanna take this code here and then go into your R console and then click run or go in your console and just download it by putting this command here. And it will take some time. Like I think for me, it took about maybe five, 10 minutes. It might be faster if you have faster internet, but it might take a little bit longer depending, but eventually it will download the whole thing. And, and this is just a accessing like the object used to kind of access the download. And then once you it's done, um, you can move on to the next stage after you download the whole data set where once you download it, um, you, you'll be able to set up a little schema to be able to read it. But before I get into it, this is just an extra note that usually when you're dealing with large file sizes, it's important that depending on the file size, you want the twice amount of space in memory to do it. So in our case, you have a nine gigabyte file. That means you need 18 gigs in memory to be able to load it. Yeah which um, might be a lot, especially if you have computers that might not be very high end to be able to handle it. So that's kind of a rule of thumb whenever you're loading a data set where depending on the size, you need twice the amount in memory to be able to load it and work with it. And to open this big giant data set, instead of using read CSV, which will take a long time because of just how many rows there are, you can use something built into the arrow package called open data set to open it. Or basically the way it works is that it, the, when you run this function, this open data set where you specify the source, meaning where the data is, and then the column type, the schema, where you wanna kind of basically specify the format of string where you can tell people, tell it what kind of variable types that you want the columns to be. So in this case, you just want the ISBN to be a string Otherwise, it was just going to read it as a number. And then the format, where in this case, we're telling it it's a CSV file. So the way this thing works is that it just looks at a couple of rows and in order to figure out the structure and the columns, basically what variable type is each column and how is the data stored? And so if you run this command here, it should be fairly quick. So if I go into let's say my, my R studio, I run this, it should be pretty quick. It runs pretty nicely. And if you decided to take a look at it, you can see here that it has this many rows and has 12 columns. You see, it's a lot. And you can see here that we do have a couple of string variables. So things like material type, like what kind of material is it? Is it a book or ebook? And then the only thing that's an, a number are the checkout year, the month, and the number of checkouts for that particular month or in that particular period of time that's being recorded. But everything else is a string, so this looks good. Right? And this stuff, you can get it from... running this command here called glimpse, which will take a long time. So if you do run this, do you know it might take a couple of minutes because it is pretty huge. So if you run this, it'll give you details on type of what kind of information is stored in it. So like I said before, you have a lot of string column types, except these three here, checkout year, checkout month, checkouts, which are all integers. And then you have this many rows, which are in the millions and then 12 columns. So. It's a lot, and I know we've kind of done a lot of error, but you will see later on why that's important and how does it help us work with this big giant data set. Sure. And now that we have the data loaded, 
um, we can do a lot of things with this data set. Like you can do calculations with the data using dplyr functions. So all the things that you've done, like um, group by, summarize, or mutate, or all of that things that you've learned in the previous chapters that you've seen here, you can do that with this data set. So let's say, as an example, let's say I want a summary of the data where I want to see how many checkouts in total per year in across all the C Seattle libraries. So you can do the group by where you order it based on the year, and then you summarize where you add up all the checkouts. So you get the total checkout for the month, I mean, for the year. <laughs> and then you want to organize it based on the checkout year. So that way we can see in, in order. So from the earliest year to the latest year, and then collect, which will, what this command do does is that it will collect all this data since the CSV here is stored in sort of like a, like a database kind of format, the, the arrow format that I mentioned earlier, this collect will cause it to basically run this, run this thing here and then give you the output. So that's a, just a slight difference. So every time you want to get results, you want to run collect. So it, it will tell it directly to fetch data from it. And this is just so it saves space. That way it's not um, pulling more data than you need. Yeah, otherwise it's gonna take a long time to run that. And so if I go here, and this one I already, this one um, might take a while, but if you run it, you should get this tibble here where you have a column for the checkout years for each year, and then you have a summary of the number of checkouts per year here for each of that. So you can see here, you can do a lot of the same dplyr stuff that you've done with other types of data. So that's kind of where it's useful. So any dplyr stuff you want to do, you can do it with here. OK, um, moving on. So as you've seen before, earlier, um, reading data with the package arrow is super fast. However, it's not as it's not as fast as this other method of reading data, which is called the parquet format. With as with the way parquet works is that instead of reading with like like we've seen with arrow and CSV, instead of reading in the whole data, what you can do is split the data into many files and then just read the ones that you want. That way, if you're only grabbing certain rows, you don't actually have to dig through the whole data to find it, you can look at different pieces of it. And so that's where the parquet format comes into play. It's another way you can actually read in your data. And one of the benefits of this parquet format is that it's smaller than the original CSV because of compression. Because of all these algorithms that are built into the parquet format, um, all these pieces of the original file are squished in such a way that the file size ends up being smaller. And another one is that it can track column data types versus CSV making reader making guesses. As you might recall that when you open a CSV file, right, you get basically a bunch of information where there's a comma separating each one. And the way any CSV reader works is that it looks at the data and then it makes a guess on what kind of type it is. And that's why earlier, if you recall that um, here, we specified that ISBN has to be a string because otherwise what the CSV reader is going to do is that it's going to treat it as a number when the ISBN is just an identifier. It's like an ID number. And we want you don't want it to treat as a number or think that you can do calculations with it. So, and, but with the parquet format, this isn't the case because we can preserve date column data types with it. And that's one of the benefits of it versus CS reader making guesses and requiring us to have to constantly um, tell it directly to not treat a column this, as this data type. Another benefit is that it, it follows our style of sorting data column by column versus row by row by CSV readers. So that table format that you may have learned from chapter one, where it sees things as column by column, it, it parquet format does that. 
instead of just row by row as you see with, with CSVs where everything is just separated by a comma and then the CV kind of has to look for that new line, which is like a slash and then N to figure out where the end of the row is. So that's another benefit for it. And also splits data into different pieces that you can skip over. Because one of the problems with large data set is that if you're trying to find certain pieces of information, you have to run through the whole data set just to find that part. But with the parquet format, you split it into all these tiny different pieces, which means that if you're looking for a certain piece, certain data, you don't have to read the whole data just to find that one piece. You can just go to the pieces that have the data that you want and grab them, which is a lot faster than running through the whole thing to find it. It's like um, basically checking out every book in a library just to get the book you want versus basically going to specific bookshelves just to find the get closer to the book that you want. So you can see that there's a benefit to that, reading it this way versus the the traditional way of just reading it raw as a CSV. Now, as beneficial as it is, there are a couple of downsides of the Parquet format. And one of it is that it's so efficient that humans can read it because one of the reasons why it's very efficient is that it reads things in... Um, in computer code that only the computer can understand. So if you ever try to read a parquet format file and you try to open it with like notepad or whatever you use to read a document, you're gonna get a bunch of layers and characters that don't look like words. And a, and a lot of it's because it's written in computer code. I think it's like binary, something only the computer can understand. Binary or machine language. That's how. And that's how it's kind of stored as a way to save space. So if you're trying to read it, as I've said, you probably won't be able to do that unless you load it in using a proper function that reads Parquet files. So that's just kind of a heads up, you know, downside. But despite the downsides, if you're only just using it to do some work with this data, then Parquet format should be fine, as long as you don't need to actually open it directly. And I mentioned before that um, partitioning is one of the key features of the Parquet format, where it splits the data into many files to make it easier to work with, especially when you have bigger and bigger files. And a lot of this partitioning is something that you can control yourself. And it's largely up to you on how you think is the best way to split this data set. So there isn't really any rules or guidelines specifically on what you can or can't do with partitioning. So it might take a while, some trial and error to figure out what do you think is the best way to split all these data files. But ideally, if you like to have some structure, a good number of partitions is one where there's less than 10,000 partitions where each partition is neither too small, like less than 20 megabytes, or extremely large, like greater than two gigabytes. So that's just a sweet spot. It's not a hard rule, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. If you want like the best optimal way to split a data into many files. Sure. All right, I guess move, before I move forward, um, are there any questions or any thoughts or so on? None for me. Okay. I'll keep going. And so now that I've talked a lot about partitioning, um, I'll just do a little bit of some demonstrations just to show you how this parquet format works. So here, as an example, we're going to split the data set into multiple pieces based on the checkout year, meaning each file, each parquet file, has all the data for that particular year. As you might recall from... Um, earlier that um, we were able to summarize the checkouts based on the year. So the idea behind the parquet, the, the partitioning we're going to do, is that what if we just have all the data for 2010 in one partition file, and then all the data for 2009 in one, and all 2008 in one file, and then this and that. So that's how it's going to be split, where we're only going to have data for each particular year only, which is pretty efficient. Because if you want to find data for a certain year, you don't have to read the whole file to get it. You can just 
pick the part K file that has that data for just 2010 and then open it, which saves a lot of time. And so that's how we're going to partition it. So before you partition, you want to specify the file path for where your um, partitions are going to be at. So just to make it easy, what I did was I have it where, because by default, when you open an R project, it goes to wherever directory the project is in. And so for the path, I'm just going to make a folder called data. And then basically, it's going to be called Seattle Library Checkouts, pretty much. That's what it's going to be called. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a bunch of partitions using this code here where we specify Seattle CSV. And then we say we want to group it by checkout year, where each partition has data only for that year. So all the data for 2008 is in one piece of the piece of the file. All the data for 2010 is in one file, and then so on and so forth. And then you write it where you specify the path, like where a file is going to be stored. What's, and then you also specify what kind of format. So in this case, it's Parquet. Now, this one is going to be taking a long time, so I'm not going to run it since I already did it ahead of time. And it might take a while. I don't, don't want to take your time. But even though this whole thing will take a long time, it makes your future work a lot easier. And it's something I'm going to show you later on. And you'll see why this matters, where even though the setup takes a while, it makes any data analysis you do moving forward much faster. So you want to go to your R console, go down to, say, your car console, where you specify your path right here, and then you want to run this. So Seattle CSV, pipe it, group by, check out year, pipe it, write data set, and then the arguments are path equals this PQ path that you just made, and then the format is parquet. And then you run it, it might take a couple of minutes, but it'll work, and eventually, by then, you should now have a bunch of parquet files in this folder called data. Where you see here, you have a separate folder called Seattle Library Checkouts. And you see you have all of these files right here. And you have it, you can see here, it's in parquet format. So you can see here, we have this many partitions here, all made from the original data. All right. So now that um, we've got our parquet files, Let's um, see if we can do some work with them. So, okay, so here, we're gonna use this code right here just to take a look at um, basically the size of each of the files, just to demonstrate to you how much, how small these files are in comparison to the larger file. So if you run this command, I know it's kind of double printed, I mean, I'll have to get rid of this later. But if you run Tibble and then go to files where it will just search these files, and then you have a column called size MB where it gets the file size for each one, you'll see here that you get a list of all these files and their sizes. And you can see here all, all these file sizes, they're fairly small. They're in 109 range, 164, 178 megabytes, 195, 214, 20, 20, 22. So this is just kind of a sample of all the files, parquet files we made, which in total, there are 18. But it shows you how much smaller it is compared to the original file, which if you remember, it was nine gigabytes. So which is a lot more efficient and it's faster too. And it's not, and it allows you to work with the data set where you don't have to load it all in memory and it, which saves your computer in terms of processing power. So, so, so here you go. So it's very efficient overall, you know, as a way of working with large data sets. So it's something worth checking out if you want a w faster way to read big data sets. So as a demonstration um, of Parquet files, let's do it by reading in Parquet files using open data set. Now, if you remember, um, PQ path is, remember that we made that variable previously in um, previous two, two sections. 
where we specify the file path for where all the Parquet files are stored. So we're going to use that to open this data set. And don't worry about specifying each of these files. Um, it will be, it's able to recognize the Parquet files when it, when it sees them. So we're going to go back to our, our console and then run this command and you'll be able to load it. And you see how it's really fast. So that's pretty good. And now that we've loaded in, you can use the dplyr functions that you've learned previously to be able to access the data, just like what you've done before. You know, so just how you usually do it with your data frames and your tibbles. So as an example, let's say you want to know how many books were checked out per month in the last five years. So since the data goes up to, I think it's like 2023, or actually no, 2022, we're going to get all the, the data for 2018, 2019, all the way to 2022. And you want only for books. So material type equals books. So we run this command here. into our, our console, you run it, it should be able to pull out all the data that you need. And if you're curious, you can open up the query by just typing the name of the object you stored the query in. So what's going to do is that it's going to pull the data that you need and then store it in an object. And so if you go back to your R console and you run query, you're going to see this information right here where it tells you what kind of information it's stored in. Well, it's a query. It's in a file system format. The checkout year is an integer. The checkout month is an integer numbers. And then you have column for total checkouts. And this group by checkout year just tells you how is the part of the parquet files organized by. So you can see here it's been grouped by checkout year, sorted by checkout year, checkout month. And this just in case you want to see the direct arrow object that's used to build this, this parquet format. And a lot of it is just kind of a um, summary from right here, this query right here that we did, where we did arrange. Now, if you want to actually get the results of the query, because if you just run query, it's just going to tell you information about the process of getting that information for you. It won't tell you the data that you actually want, the result of it. If you want to do that, just like I showed you before, you want to do a pipe and then type collect, which will cause that query to pull out the actual data that you want, not tell you the results of that query. So you just do query, pipe it, and then you type collect. So you type query collect, it should give you this data right here. It, it might take a while, depending on just how the parquet files are stored. But you should get this, where it has all the data here, where we, we do it per month for, for each year, all the number of checkouts. And it runs all the way to 2022. So it works. And you see here. It is a lot faster than with CSV because otherwise with CSV, it has to read all the files, all the data, and then it has to summarize it completely. And it's fast because remember that the Parquet files here are on this bottom right. They're all stored based on checkout years. So it's only containing data for each of the years because of Parquet format, it made it easy to grab this information where we just want the checkouts per month. Um, for the years from 2018 to 2022, which you see, because all it has to do is skip all this data, go to 2018, all the way to 2022, and just pull the data from here, which is a lot faster than reading this whole thing and then pulling the data that you want, which means you're wasting space grabbing data that you're not going to use just to get data that you want. So you can see it's a lot faster than just pulling it by or just by CSV, by directly. So see, it's pretty efficient. And so that's just a, one example of some of the operations that you can do with um, the Parquet format.
Now, if you're curious if um, what function are expressions that you can use with the query, you can always type this command um, question mark a zero just to see which R expressions arrow can work with. So if you run this command in your console or you're like even your R chunk, you run this, it's going to pull up some documentation. We'll show you basically how it works. And you get this documentation here where it'll tell you about the arrow package and the dplyr verbs. Like if you go to the section here, dplyr verbs, it will show you which dplyr functions can work with the arrow package. So here you have your filter and or what you've learned in the previous chapter, right join, semi join, left join up here, all these different functions that you've learned about in previous chapters that you can use with um, the arrow package. And these are just extra notes about some base R operators that you can use with it. So there's a lot to it, but it's useful if you want to know what you can do with the um, these arrow data sets and what dplyr functions are compatible with it. So just something worth checking out if you're curious, you want to play around with these arrow data sets and you want to use dplyr with it. All right, and I've kind of alluded to this previously, but in terms of performance for Arrow, let's compare um, how long it takes for you to get the data that you want with say, with Arrow versus just doing it traditionally with the CSV format. So here, I don't recommend running this, which will take a long time. Let's see how long it takes to get the number of books checked out per month in 2021 by reading it manually as a whole CSV, where basically you load in the whole CSV, you filter it, you get by, by the year and then the material type, and then you group it by the checkout month. And then you basically summarize each month for that year, the number of checkouts, and then you arrange it in sending order by checkout month, you collect the data. And then here, the system time just means we want to collect the time it takes to complete this whole operation. And so I wouldn't recommend running this. It does take a while since you're just reading the whole data itself. But if you do, but when the pe the author ran it, they got that it was a it took a roughly about 11 seconds, 11 to 12 seconds. And, and then the elapse is 11, about roughly around 11 seconds. The system to kind of process your command was about one second. So you see here, it took some time. It's not very instantaneous. This might differ if you have a slower computer or a computer with less RAM, but it would generally take a little bit longer than expected to run this command, right? And on the other hand, let's see it with the parquet format, where we're doing the same thing as we did earlier, where we're getting the number of books checked out per month in 2021, but this time we're going to use the parquet format. So we're, we're using Seattle PQ, pipe it, filter, check out year goes 2021. The material type is a book. We group each of the data sets by the checkout month. We summarize it where we get the total number of checkouts per month. We arrange the checkout months in descending order by checkout month. And then we collect, meaning we, we get the data, the result of that query, and then we count, take, we measure the time it took to run this whole thing. And you can see here, it's a lot faster than what we did by just pulling in the raw CSV. See here, it took less than a second to run this whole thing. It took this much seconds for the system to process it, all, all these steps. And then for the user, just it took this much just to run it and then elapse. That's the amount of time that transpired. So you can see here, it's a lot faster than just reading in the raw CSV where it took seconds, like seconds where you do have to wait a little bit. So you can see here, Arrow is pretty useful for working with large data sets. And you can see how powerful it is when you have a situation like this, where you want to grab certain data, but your data set's just too large to just run at once. Ken? Yeah. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between this one and the one before? Oh, like the top, like like yeah. this. 
Seattle CSV? Oh, it's the data. It's the data. So we're pulling from the CSV directly. And then what's the other one? From the parquet, because remember the files yeah. that we split into? Okay, I didn't see the, I didn't realize the difference in the name. Yeah. Yeah, okay. CRPQ. That's just the object we use to, to cut it into pieces, the file. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was looking at the other stuff and I'm like, wait, they look the same. I didn't realize. Okay, yes. So data set. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, the PQ is basically the object we use to split, cut the data into pieces. Yeah. Yeah, that's talking to all these parquet files. But you can see here, it's all really fast and really shows you just how powerful it is with working with large data sets. So if you ever working with large data sets, parquet files is definitely one of those ways which you can do about it quickly. And this is just kind of repeating what I've said before, where you saw how working with the data with in terms of parquet files takes a lot less time versus more than 10 seconds with reading the whole CSV. And a lot of it has to do with this partitioning and storing data in binary, which I mentioned before is the language that the computer, only the computer can understand. And then part of the reason why it's fast, which I kind of mentioned earlier, is because Arrow only needs to grab the data for 2021. And you recall that we split the data into pieces based on the checkout year. So you see here, you have 2005 all the way to 2022. So to run that query that we just ran, where we're only getting the checkout year for 2021, instead of having to read all this data and then cutting out all this just ex except for 2021, all we had to do is jump into one of these folders and then grab the data right there. And if you remember, that piece of the data was about maybe a couple hundred, 200 megabytes, which is pretty small. So it's much faster than reading in all nine gigs, which is a lot. And so you can see here, it's pretty fast. We skipped out all the unnecessary data just to get to the data that we want. And that speaks to how powerful Arrow is when working with large data sets. And lastly, um, one of the cool things about Arrow is that you can make your Arrow data set become a DuckDB data database, which you saw in chapter 21. So if, you're, if you wanna work with the stuff that you learned in chapter 21, all you have to do is convert, use the arrow to, duck, to DuckDB function to make your arrow data set be a DuckDB database. And you don't need to do all this conversion stuff because arrow is already arranged in a format that DuckDB can recognize. So, and so all you have to do is just specify your parquet object. So Seattle PQ, and then you, Type it to, to DuckDB, and then and then here you can, if you want, you can um, basically um, do some queries with it where you get some summary statistics. So in this case, we're just getting the total number of checkouts per year. And then just like before, if you want to get the result of the query, you want to run collect, which will grab the results of it instead of telling you how do the result, how are the results. So if you run this in um, here, it might take a while, and but essentially you get this results right here. You got this nice little table, and that's just a warning telling you that it will just remove any missing values in terms of the calculations which you can adjust by just putting na.remove to basically <clears throat> specify it or not have it do that. But overall, it, it works pretty well. And you get this result right here. And let's see here. Okay. So overall, that's, that's pretty much it for um, this, this chapter. I go on. Um, are there any questions or any thoughts, comments? None for me, but thank you so much. This is very interesting. Yeah, I've never worked with Arrow, so looking forward to looking into it. For sure. But like, 
for definitely like this is the first time I've heard it as well. So, but and and it's something that probably would be very useful to in a lot of those niche cases for sure. All right. Uh, Ken, Ken, I'm wondering about the the sequencing of the pipes. So if you look at the DuckDB example, for example, for, you know, yeah. the starting point, I'm kind of curious why two DuckDB is not at the end, right? Like if you if you follow the logic of of it, it's like yeah. you do collect at the end, and then and then it becomes two DuckDB, but it sort of like comes in the middle. <laughs> It's just a curiosity, but uh, it, I, I don't know if there's an answer to that, though. Um, So the, for the, the DuckDB, just basically, it just converts this into a DuckDB. Yeah, because this is just trying to demonstrate that you can get the same results with the DuckDB, just showing you that the conversion, show the conversion happening, and also you can get roughly the same results. Oh, I see. I, I thought it would be something like uh uh do you do the collect and then afterwards the results would be two duck db. Okay, okay. Now I yeah. get it. Because you have to convert it. I'm just showing like these same functions work with duck db and that duck db can read parquet. Yeah, so I think all of it sends all of the data to duck db. Then within duck db, you're doing like the specific querying is what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. But I'm I'm showing that it can be converted and that all the same things that you learn with filtering and dplyr, it can work with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. All right. Anything else? No, but thank you. All right. So that's it for um um this this book club meeting. Um I guess if that's the case, then um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, hope you all enjoy this and found it very helpful and useful. And I look, I hope you hope to see you all in the next book club meeting. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day.